I just finished a video about Shad Brooks and that shooting. And now I gotta redo it because of new information. Start out by saying that I watched body cam footage of watched body cam footage from both officers. First officer has about 40 minutes before the incident takes place. Second officer is from the time he arrives, obviously, and a good period of time after the shooting. Listen to the 911 call. Pretty standard. It was made from an employee of Wendy's who said, come get this guy out of the drive-thru. We try to talk to him. He's not responding. He's just sleeping. I also watched the family press conference. And that's where I ended the last video talking. That's where I ended the last video talking about that. But now there is also a charge in this case. So finish up with a different conclusion. The officer arrived on the scene and was, the officer arrived on the scene and in my opinion was more than fair with Mr. Brooks. He was to the point of being accommodating. Now, I, I, I know there's going to be people that are going to say, what are you talking about? It's quite simple, dude. That shit would have never happened to me. There's no cop out there, black or white, city cop country cop there's no cop out there that would have told me 15 times any one thing just repeated it and not immediately escalated uh because i didn't listen you know tell me to get in the fucking car to sit down and i don't do it maybe i get told twice at the most and then i'm put on the curb in cuffs in the back of the car or i'm told get in the car they're not going to be like these guys were. There, there were multiple times where, in my opinion, without a doubt, they were going to let this dude go. My opinion with the, with the way that they were asking him questions up until the last couple of minutes where the second officer, the officer that shot, administered the blood, administered the field sobriety breathalyzer test. Up through that point, both officers, to me, gave the impression that they were looking for an out for this guy. I watched his family say that they could have just let him walk home. They considered it. In my opinion, they considered it. They considered letting him sleep. Just leaving him alone. And I believe they even considered a third option, letting somebody come pick him up. The problem is that Mr. Brooks could not answer any questions uh, consistently he couldn't answer basic questions questions that they gave him an answer to what city are you in what street are you on where are you staying who are you with what were you doing now you, i understand again you talk to a cop you don't have to give them any information that isn't relevant to uh that is irrelevant to the investigation or the current defense etc but he knew he was drunk he was trying to answer these questions, and he was answering them poorly. And even after they had to tell him he was in the city of Atlanta, he didn't even realize he was in Atlanta. He thought he was in the suburb or something. And if you want to give the guy a pass, right, like, oh, I'm going to give this dude a chance, you know, just going to de-escalate this, especially considering the current climate, as I hear people keep saying, right? Well, sure, if I, I let him sleep in his car... Uh, as an officer, almost unheard of them being like this. They used to be like this 50 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago. You could get cops to do this kind of stuff. But cops don't do this shit anymore, thanks to fucking lawyers. All right? And I still believe they were thinking about it. Now, the cops got to be thinking to himself, I let this fucking guy sleep in his car. I let this guy walk home. What happens if he hits somebody when he leaves? What happens if he's walking home and he gets hit by a car? What happens if he gets in a fight? What happens if he goes to his house and some other kind of uh, violence against his family is committed? They're going to come and they're going to sue Atlanta PD and the city of Atlanta. My supervisor, whether it's lieutenant, captain, or, or chief, what, they're going to look at it and go, what, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why didn't you arrest this guy? Why didn't you detain him? Why didn't you administer field sobriety? And they got to be thinking this. And when this family friend who is a lawyer said, 
Well, this is where it could have ended. They could have just let him walk home right here. Are you fucking serious, dude? Could have let him walk home? First of all, cops don't do that, okay? We don't have a white people card, all right? I don't have a white people card that says, here, here's my white boy card. Let me out of all trouble, all right? It, it doesn't work that way. So the fact that they were even considering that, man, you being an attorney, how can you be serious knowing that how liability law works? If you want to be mad at anything, be mad at the body cam. Because if there was any consideration at letting him go, which I believe there was, if there was any consideration at letting him go after they were certain he was impaired, and also certain, because I don't think there's any doubt that it was certain, that he was cognitively dissident or confused or couldn't remember something from five seconds ago. He couldn't remember what he drank. Four, five, six, ten times I asked him the same question. His answer kept changing. How is he going to remember, this cop told me I can't drive? Or, I told this cop I was going to go home. I'm just going to go home and not cause any issue. How, how could they believe that he would remember that? You know, come on. You, you... And it's all there on the body cam. So when something does happen and an attorney goes after the city of Atlanta or the Atlanta Police Department or this particular, either one of those particular officers civilly, when that happens, we're, they're going to say, let's see the body cam footage. So come on, dude. Be real. You know, he also held up a picture of a, a, a vehicle that had a bullet, a bullet mark. Uh, right at the bottom of one of the rear quarter panels. Now this is this is something different. Talking about the next part about the actual shooting, it, it seems to me he was shooting low. I, I don't necessarily think he was even trying to hit center mass, but you know, it's impossible to know exactly what was in the guy's mind. But all I know is that when this kind of stuff happens, when violence happens, it happens quickly. Something like this just happened to me a few weeks ago. I talked about it. If you've watched my videos, you've seen it. You know, I got I got run up on and got mugged. They snatched my phone, punched me in the face. And that stuff happens in moments. Now, officers and military personnel, for example, they're more trained in, in, in high-intensity situations, and they're more trained to deal with this stuff. So, sure, it's going to be a little bit, of a different response when someone like that is handling it. But this wasn't just one thing that happened, man. He made several bad choices in a row, you know? And if you ignore all of his questionable choices up to the point where he got arrested, from the point that they told him they were going to arrest him, he resisted arrest. He fought with the officers. He stole an officer's weapon, regardless of which weapon. Then he fleed the scene fleet arrest then he fired at the cop then he didn't drop the fucking taser either and kept running nothing there nothing there was the right way to handle that you know maybe i do have a white people card maybe because when i was little i was taught you don't fuck with the police and I was also taught that if you do anything to the police, like you assault them, you shoot at them. Uh, actually, I was given many more examples, even less dramatic than that. But you do anything to the police, you, you're in fucking trouble. You're never going to win that. You're going to get arrested or you're going to get hurt. Maybe that's a white people thing. I mean, black people don't teach your kids that. Maybe they teach them like it's cool, you know, when a cop tries to arrest you it's a suggestion it's not actually something that has to happen i don't know but i understand the whole concept of police brutality i understand the whole idea of the black lives matter used in this context and used as a a, a vehicle for the protests i i get that okay so i'm not stupid but you also have to ask yourself if you watch this cam footage, which I have, did Mr. Brooks seem scared at all through the entire time that he was interacting with the police up to the moment that he decided he was going to resist arrest? 
because that's very important. It's very important because this attorney for the family also mentioned that a big part of the problem was that he, Mr. Brooks personally, and, and he sounded like it was a lot of other people, a lot of other people in the black community were affected by this, what I'm going to call justifiable post-traumatic stress. And that that came from the watching George Floyd's murder and from having the few sec the last few seconds, the most popular clip of his life replayed and replayed and replayed and having the picture of that cop Siobhan with his neck, with his knee on Floyd's neck put up everywhere consistently that was creating post-traumatic stress i'm not so sure i believe that because mr brooks is on probation and i did see another video where he was talking to somebody else saying you know i'm on probation any little thing fucking sets me off and i gotta go back i, I know probation's like i've done that that's how it is but you know again these are choices man when you get super fucked up and drive yourself around while you're on probation, knowing that the second the cops see motherfuckers on probation, they know they can violate you, they can do it for so many things. You gotta you gotta just not do that, right? So I see him being concerned about probation revocation, and that's the reason that he ran. I also see him thinking, this is a crapshoot. I can throw dice here because Right now, police are afraid to do their job, even the most rudimentary. Even when I am obviously hammered, I might still be able to get away with this because the cops might not choose to do anything about it. That's what I see. He's a smart guy. Nice enough guy on the surface, too. I mean, if I met him and he was talking, like he seemed like a pleasant dude. I saw he's seen his record. That's a whole other thing. But, I mean, he seemed like a nice guy, so... It's not, you know, he was in control of himself. He understood what was happening. You know, enough, he understood what, he was, what was happening to him enough that that choice was conscientious. He's also drunk enough that he wasn't making good choices. Which is why if they would have let him go, let him walk home or told him he could sleep in his car or anything else, he might have con continued to make bad choices that they would have been liable for. The department, the city, and personally the officers. What else could they have done when he was running is a whole other argument because what he did justified the force under current law. But a lot of people are saying current law, current police protocols, what's fucked and we want to change that. <sighs> Okay, so just to take that argument just a, a, a little bit further, if that's the case, you see that Rolf reaches for his gun as Brooks is holding the taser out at him. They're saying now that he made a draw and has tried to draw his gun before the taser. I, I, I didn't see that, but I'll watch it again. Point being, though, no matter what happened in that situation, Brooks was creating more distance between himself and the officer that was closest behind him, and the other officer was further back. This just means a foot chase isn't going to work. He's faster. He's going to be faster, and the longer they pursue him on foot, the further away he's going to get. So they have to make a choice, and that choice was accelerated by that dude shooting the taser, not dropping the taser, shooting it at him. I mean, he just... I want you also to consider that you know, once cops roll up on you and they get your ID, once they once they know who you are, they see your entire record. And this dude has a long record from the last 10 years. He has a consistent record of several violations every year, except for one year that I think he was in jail. So for the last decade, there's no change in that behavior. And even seeing everything on his record, there was a lot of violence on his record, stuff involving violence. You know, I just... It's, forget the other stuff even after seeing all that they didn't call in six cops right away like oh this guy could potentially be violent they didn't talk to him like he was a piece of shit they did essentially what i kind of thought was part of what defund meant because 
instead of judging him off his past actions, which people had said about George Floyd, well, George Floyd, you know, was part of a strong arm robbery where there's a pregnant woman and he was, you know, well, that was in the past and that wasn't who he was now. So for them officers to respond to him like that was a fresh crime shows that they weren't putting his past in his past, giving him an actual chance. Regardless of how you feel about that argument, point being, same mindset applied to this. Did, did those cops treat him like a piece of shit who had fucking been charged and convicted four or five, six times for assaulting his own family? No. Did they, did they treat him like any kind of piece of shit, hood rat, street rat, scumbag? Did they? I, I don't think so. I mean, what I saw was not only fair but accommodating treatment on the part of the officers up through, really up through the arrest attempted arrest but let's just go back a couple of minutes before because it's easy to pick apart what the officer did as far as the breathalyzer because in the last two minutes right before the breathalyzer he was repeating his questions and he was trying to get that guy to admit that he was drunk but this is not something unique to this situation this is not something unique to police in atlanta this is not something unique to white police etc etc this is what they do. Cops are bullies. It's part of their job. It's kind of, you know, they always want, I mean, this is just how they fucking do it. DAs do it too. They try to get, they, they repeat themselves when they don't like the answer that you give to try to get you to admit guilt. Sometimes it's to get you to trip up on a question and answer it two different ways. And sometimes it's to get you to admit guilt because it makes their fucking job easier. This is why every single person who's made a YouTube video that talks about freedom of speech or your right to remain silent has told you whenever you are in a situation, a hundred different people who've made videos relating to your rights tell you, shut your fucking mouth. So everybody's attorneys will tell you, criminal attorneys, shut your fucking mouth. Once you realize you're going to be arrested, there's nothing more that needs to be said. So yeah, that is a method that all cops use. FBI, fucking regular police, it doesn't matter. So anybody could look at just that part, the last couple of minutes right before the breath lies and say, yeah, this guy was being fucking racist because he's trying to trip him up, get him to admit his guilt. Then they kind of bullied him into a breathalyzer. Well, dude, if you say no to the breathalyzer, they're, they can arrest you anyways. And then they take you to the station and they force you to do a blood draw. And then it goes on the arrest record when it goes in front of the DA for your prosecution for drunk driving that you refuse the field sobriety test and then never helps you in court. You could still refuse it, but it never fucking helps you in court. The only reason to refuse a field sobriety test is to because you're not drunk. If you're drunk, you're fucked anyways. The field sobriety test will put you over the edge, but and you, you ain't going to have anything defensible to say, but that's not really even the point. So, I've said before that a lot of the things that the, I'm going to just say Black Lives Matter people, a lot of the things the Black Lives Matter protesters have said have been things that I think have to do with either discipline over a statute or a rule or a law that already exists or execution of a law or the, the fact that they don't like some of the laws that are on the books. I whole fucking heartedly agree. There are a ton of laws I don't like. But being mad at police, it's not the same thing. So, setting aside examples where they cite clear racism, everything else that they don't like is, is either procedural or has to do with the fact that that law exists. So yeah, this is a procedural thing. Are police allowed to try to bully the fuck out of you? But here, here's what it comes down to, though, man. Where is the fucking... Where's Mothers Against Drunk Driving and where are the feminists who like to jump on... For example, two separate groups, but they like to jump on anything in the news that even slightly ticks, that even slightly sets off a, a tick in their radar. You know what I mean? There are plenty of feminists that would have issue with the with his family history that would say this person deserves no fucking chance because of how they behave and they did it multiple times. But you don't hear one of them, not a peep. What about Mothers Against Drunk Driving and every other advocacy group for people who have been injured by somebody or killed by somebody who is drunk? There's a lot of them, but where are they? Why aren't they saying something? Because 
those people created let those people were part of the reason that legislation was created to make driving drunk pretty much impossible to do legally you can have one maybe two drinks maybe and and be able to drive and anything past that you're gonna you're gonna get arrested and essentially the public sentiment on that for years now by the social justice warriors especially by the people who are involved in in black lives matter especially a good portion of them are the same people that complain about uh the white people are the same people that complain about the uh, about drinking and driving and it made it even more impossible have made it more cultural pardon me have made it culturally appropriate popular more acceptable to just say i've had one drink therefore i'm not going to drive and i mean shit there's fucking uber which is significantly cheaper than a taxi, which is what anybody recommends when people are drinking. So there's all that, but none of that shit gets brought up. All that gets brought up is the use of deadly force. Well, this cop now has been charged with murder. I had a hard enough time watching this press conference and some of the stuff that they said, including the whole confusing thing about, I thought he was married and yet he was with a girlfriend and this girlfriend had a birthday on the same day as his kid. There was a lot of confusing stuff there, but part of that came from the way he answered stuff, which is my point. He's not, he wasn't making complete sense. So you gotta, you gotta be careful with what you just allow him to do, right? Especially while you're wearing a body cam. But, but now he's been charged with murder. Uh, among, among other things, he charged with aggravated assault for the round that missed Mr. Brooks and hit somebody's car. The other officer was charged with, I believe it was something like failure to uphold his duty or his oath because the other officer shot. I mean, he wasn't even anywhere in the vicinity to do any, what was he supposed to do? Was he, should he have shot the other officer? And how, how did he fail to uphold his duty? That was like the nicest cop I've ever fucking seen. The first one, both of them really, but especially that first one nicest cop I've ever fucking seen that guy <laughs> fucking amount of shit that he was willing to put up with you nobody no cop I've ever fucking encountered would handle me molly coddle me like that fucking guy did if I was that drunk when you're drunk you just lose a portion of your fucking rights nobody tolerates it sober people walking by you on the street when you're fucking drunk don't tolerate drunkenness judges in the courtroom listening to you recount when you were drunk trying to justify what you did they don't they, they don't give you your full set of rights uh when you're drunk you just you don't get to tell your story and be right when you're drunk when you're drunk and someone else is sober and you're talking about any event especially in a court the drunk person's testimony doesn't fucking mean much <clears throat> this is not this is not new news so now this guy gets charged with murder other guy gets charged with failure to uphold his duty and what kind of precedent does this set police cannot arrest anybody police cannot arrest anybody black it's okay to drink and drive it's okay essentially to do any kind of crime that you want to do that doesn't involve violence when they show up it's okay to do any kind of crime that you want to do because when the police come, they can't actually arrest you. They can try to arrest you, but if you can run, then you can get away. And if every time you interact with them, you claim that you're scared, you're afraid for your life, or you continue to run, you know, you can essentially make them play cat and mouse with you for as long as you can keep it up. That's kind of what that precedent would set going forward is kind of saying, I mean, there are cops in my city right now, right? And in the last few weeks, I haven't seen any of them. You know, in the area I live in, there's a lot of patrols that drive by. And I do still see patrols driving by. But they're not like, I couldn't talk to one of them to save my fucking life. I couldn't find one parked anywhere as you often can, either because they're in the middle of doing something at the location that they're parked at, or because they're just parking somewhere for a while to be a presence. They're not doing that. They're not anywhere. Because they don't want to interact with anybody. 
because everybody's got a fucking camera and wants to walk up to them <clears throat> and say who knows what. They could be saying, hi, police, how you doing? They could be saying, you're a fucking pig piece of shit. And they're not allowed to, you know, they're not allowed to do anything but try to avoid people. So this case is now going to set a precedent going forward more and more so that that's okay. It, it was already like this because of the protests, because of what happened to George Floyd, and now it's just going to get worse. You're going to need the police. They're not going to want to show up, or if they show up, they're not going to do anything. I'm also, I'm also far, there's a fall off from everything, like with coronavirus, there's a lot of schools that now going back into the fall are already talking about we're not going to have any school, which is a, a different conversation, but just to show the littlest things can make a big ripple big things make make waves you know it's coronavirus had this country split on how they felt people should be acting it was uh it was and still is uh one of the craziest things i've ever seen and now we have this well this isn't a ripple this isn't a big wave this is a tsunami you know i talked to a lot of black people too i i suppose i should qualify a lot i have talked to a few black people also about this since this happened and I had a couple suggest that this dude wasn't normal you know they said listen that's some white people bullshit to be getting fucking talked to because you fucked up in public and instead of shutting your fucking mouth especially when you see that they might be like you can go maybe Instead of shutting your fucking mouth to just keep getting in their face, keep talking, keep talking. This this dude was out of his mind. That that's what they've said. I said, I agree. I agree with it for a different reason. I never, you know, I wouldn't have thought put it. He goes, Yeah, that's some white people bullshit. You know, essentially that's some Karen bullshit, right? Whatever. Think about the uh so anyways, what about the fallout from this, right? You're talking about a uh, tidal wave or a tsunami. I mean, I've already felt racial tension with a lot of black people that I have come across since this has happened just people that I don't know that are walking down the street there's, there's been a few that have been a little more friendly than I would say is is normal and then there have been many more who have just given me looks like I'm the enemy I'm the enemy I don't know these people I haven't said anything to them I'm not doing anything at that moment offensive so I was already concerned that this entire black lives matter instead of being a unifying thing that we say to help black people who feel like they aren't getting a fair shake which is now transferred to what seems like it's becoming a political party i was already concerned with the way that the, the race relations were going and how that fallout was going to go but dude after after something like this i mean hard enough with corona to know whether or not I should put my kid back in school. But with this, with this sentiment of police can't do anything, and also at the same time with a lot of the black population that I have encountered since this has happened, looking at me as if I am the problem simply because of my race, why would I send my young kid back to school in a school that's very integrated i mean it's what happens if something does happen and somebody does pick on her because of her race what happens if uh she gets approached by several people at once and they decide they're going to push her around or even start to hurt or hit her who's going to intervene a staff member like who not a white one fuck no a black one maybe but Honestly, the way that this culture and movement from this Black Lives Matter has been going, they've now pretty much made it so that anyone that does not cooperate, endorse, fund, or in some way speak out for whatever exactly Black Lives Matter movement means, because as you saw in my other video, it kind of means different things. If you don't do that, you're racist. That can now be extended to anybody. So I'm imagining my kid in school, my kid who's a sweet kid, who's nice to everybody, who has friends of all races in her school, who she hangs out with, 
all those fr friends of all races all the time. I imagine if something happens to her, she gets picked on. Randomly or specifically, there's not going to be anybody to help her. They won't even call the police because the police might not come. It might be a new school district policy to not involve the police when stuff like that happens. And who at the school is going to stop it? It's a big risk. And that, that facet of this is not going to go away. That's not something where if, if this, this movement doesn't have a leader, but that's not something where if they did have a leader and the guys stood up tomorrow and said, okay, protests are over, we got what we want, theoretically. That sentiment is not going to go away. That's stirred up. And this goes back to what that guy said about the justifiable post-traumatic stress is the last thing I'm going to say is that if you want to, you know, if you have a therapist who's talking to their client, they're, you know, in therapy about the most heinous thing I can think of, like child rape, okay? At some point during their therapy, the, the, the victim has to talk about the event or events in some detail. However, going forward, that therapist trying to help the person heal and move on with their life is not going to while trying to help the person heal, continue to bring up, continue to bring up specific details about, about the events because that would be considered obscene. Yet the media continues to play the video and audio clip of George Floyd's last minute of his life and continues to throw pictures of Siobhan kneeled on Floyd's neck. What does that do? That stimulates the trauma center of your brain. It activates fight or flight. And... If you are in the black community and concerned that this is the type of thing that could happen to you, justly or unjustly, with a reason or without a reason, but if you are, and we're talking about moving forward and healing and fixing this problem, when you continually stimulate a person's trauma center, when you continually intentionally put them into fight or flight, especially if they're already prone, a person who is already prone to violence, what kind of response do you expect to happen? And... That would be the fault of the mainstream media, and they should be culpable for that. And the very last thing that I would say, though, is that another question that needs to be answered along with how the future is going to go, is the media complicit in making this worse, is quite simply, dude, when does it ever become the person's responsibility to make different choices?